summer of 93, Sergeant Kenny Thomas was deployed to Mogadishu, Somalia with Bravo Company of the 3rd Ranger Battalion as part of a special operations package called Task Force Ranger. Their mission was to find and capture a criminal warlord named Mohammed Farah Adid. On the 3rd of October, Sergeant Thomas and his fellow Rangers distinguished themselves in an 18-hour firefight that would later be recounted in the highly successful book and movie Black Hawk Down. 19 Americans died and 78 were wounded in the worst urban combat seen by U.S. troops since World War II. Eventually, Kenny got out of the Army to pursue his music career and now works full-time as an award-winning Nashville recording artist. His band, Cornbread, was featured in the movie Sweet Home Alabama and regularly tours with the USO to perform for our military personnel serving in the Middle East. As an entertainer, Kenny has been recognized by Congress, the White House, and was recently inducted into the VFW Hall of Fame for his dedicated work on behalf of veterans and military families. Kenny is a graduate of the University of Florida and a recipient of the Bronze Star with Valor. Please turn your attention to the screen. Between 1990 and 1992, an estimated 300,000 Somali people died of starvation in Mogadishu, Somalia due in large part to the seizure and theft of over 80% of the food being shipped into the country as a part of humanitarian relief. At this point, the United States stepped in, sending 400 Special Forces soldiers as a part of Operation Restore Hope. The primary focus of their mission was the capture of Warlord General Mohammed Farah Adid and his high-level supporters. On October 3, 1993, the U.S. military engaged in a mission to capture several of Adid's high-ranking lieutenants. Thirty-five minutes later, the mission was completed with minimal complications, with 12 of Adid's men captured. As the triumphant soldiers awaited extraction, the unthinkable happened. A U.S. Black Hawk helicopter was hit by an insurgent's RPG, sending it spiraling into the Somali dirt below. The soldiers were now involved in a rescue mission, and Army Ranger Kenny Thomas was thrust into a leadership role and a race to the fallen Black Hawk. The battle fought by Sergeant Thomas, which took the lives of 18 U.S. soldiers, was later immortalized in the book and film Black Hawk Down. More than 20 years later, Kenny is still involved in the military, this time behind a microphone with the USO, performing songs from his successful country music career. Here to tell us about his career and personal experience in this historic event, please welcome Kenny Thomas. Hey, 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 what's up, California? All right, so thank you for having me. I know that you probably had your pick or choice. You could have asked anybody, but you asked me, so thank you, I appreciate it. It is an honor. And this is a privilege, and I mean it in the truest sense of the word. I, yeah, before I get going, I just want to warn you guys. I don't know what kind of keynote speakers y'all are used to, but I'm a little different. I, I don't even, honestly, I don't even know what the word keynote means. And I do not have, I have no presentation for you. I have no slides. I have no PowerPoints. I have no whiteboards. I'm just, if I... If I had been in the Air Force, I would have brought some of that high-speed stuff, but I was in the Army and we weren't that smart, we didn't have the budget. So um, they just taught us, hey, if you're going to give a block of instruction, you should tell a story. And obviously, I've got a pretty good story to tell you. I have learned how to tell it. So we're going to make some points. Now we're going to talk a little bit. There's these three fundamental issues or principles that they teach you in the military, in the Ranger Regiment that are key to mission success. So the first one's planning. If you fail to make a plan, plan on failing. Next one's training. The way we talk about it is to train as you fight, fight as you train. Mostly what I want to focus on today is the third element of mission success, and that's you guys. And we call it leadership. How many leaders do I have in here? <laughs> we'll see at the end of this story. Well, that'll probably change. So, um, now, before I get going, for the veterans that raised your hand, thank you very much. How many people in here have a family member that have served in the military? Y'all raise your hand for me. 
Okay. That's a small, that's a small, it's not that big of a number because the military, as you know, is a family business. It's just like agriculture. There are very few folks that do it. But if you know those people and you have friends that have served, go talk to them. They will tell you the same stories that I'm fixing to tell you. They will laugh in the same places that I think it's funny. It'll be personal to them where I think it's personal. It's World War II, grandpas in Korea. My father was in Vietnam. My best friends over in Afghanistan. All of us that have been in the desert and back. When we come home, the stories we tell are never about ourselves. Like, we're not, I'm not up here bragging about myself. If you ever meet a veteran that brags about himself, you should punch him in the throat. He's lying. We all, the only reason I'm here by the grace of God is because of the people that are on my left and my right, and, and that's why I'm, so, I'm very proud to tell their story. And ours started on a day off from training. We weren't supposed to be working. I'm glad you got to see the video because the video gives you a good background on what was happening over there. We were going after this guy, a deed. If we couldn't get a deed, we were going after his top echelon. So we had this most wanted list, right? F three months we had been in country, 44 raids into the city. It was taking its toll. We were pretty tired. We hadn't gotten a deed yet. And so finally on the day off, they said, Take, do whatever it is you guys want to do. Guys out there playing volleyball. I was writing a letter home to my mom. You know. I'm totally, she still has the front end of the letter. I was totally lying to her. Dear mom, you would love it here in sunny Mogadishu. It looks just like Fort Lauderdale. And she's like, because mom doesn't want to know what's really going on over there. They're throwing mortar rounds at you every other day. They don't like us being there. So we're just hanging out. And the guy walks out of the airplane hangar, which is about half the size of this building right here. And this is how it goes down. He just yells, hey. Get it on! And it meant emissions coming down, gear it up, exactly like a firefighter police officer gets that call. So everybody drops what they're doing, we all go hustling in, we jump in front of our gear, we're grabbing our equipment, we're hollering out checklists, and it looks really chaotic because there's squads all over, the, all over the airplane hangar. And it looks chaotic, but it's really orchestrated because we've done this a bunch. And the only thing that's probably important about this part of the story for y'all is that you don't just it's not just grab your own gear and run out to the helicopter, hey, I beat you. You gotta take a second and help the person on your left. Hey, do you have everything you need? Is there anything I can do to help carry for you? Because no job's independent. We all count on each other. The machine gunner needs you to help carry the rounds because he can't carry them all. The medic needs you to help carry stuff that he needs to save your life. So we're all kind of helping each other out. And you've seen the modern combat soldier. You know what we wear, just to give you an idea, with that body armor, with the kit, with the, with the ammo, with your basic weapon system, that's about 30 pounds of gear. So I weigh 160. I'm not a big guy. You put 30 pounds on me, I'm now some, I'm now... I was in the army, 190, thank you. Um, so they start adding things to that. So to give you an idea, I had, I had a rifle, I had a shotgun, I had frag grenades, incendiary grenades, crowd dispersal grenades, a medical kit, and they issued this, it was this old Vietnam era rocket launcher called the Light Anti-Tank Weapon. I, the LAW, law. I hated carrying the law because, well, first of all, it wasn't light. And secondly, I never met one single Somali with a tank. And I remember asking my platoon, so I was like, Sergeant Watson, why do I got to carry this thing? They don't have any tanks. And he looks at me as a man with way more combat experience than I ever had. And he says, hey, it's better to have and not need than to need and not have. I might need it, but I'm not carrying it, so you will. <laughs> feel, feel, feel free to use that one. All right, so... Um, the squads are all getting lined up, and I want you guys to, um, a squad size element. So a squad size element is about 10 to 12 people. That's usually a good size, full strength. Ranger regiment's always been short-handed, which is a tough unit to get into. We were never at full strength. We only had half guys, so we were five men in our squad. I'm going to introduce you to them all right now. So the first guy was Doug. Doug Bourne was the squad leader. Doug and I were the exact same rank, E5s, sergeants. We had pinned on our stripes at the same ceremony. I don't know how come Doug got to be a squad leader and I didn't. And that was what I remember going to my attention. I said, hey, Sergeant Watson, how come Sergeant Boren gets to be the squad leader? And, I'd, and you know what? To this day, the only answer I was ever given was, well, because he's from Texas. So apparently, those people down there outrank us. I don't know what that's all about. So my middle guy, my most, so, that, so here's what's going to happen. Squad leaders and the platoon sergeants are going to go in and they're going to get the mission brief. And that leaves the team leaders to take care of teams. This is my team. My most senior guy was Melvin DeJesus. DeJesus was not a sergeant yet, but he had been to ranger school. So when you go to ranger school and you get through that course and it's a big, tough leadership school, you earn that ranger tab. It's like, I don't know if there's any Eagle Scouts in here, but it's a lot like getting your Eagle Scout badge. It's a big deal. You come back to the regiment and now we're going to groom you to be a team leader. De Jesus was a street hard guy raised in the hood in Puerto Rico. He, he, had, he was a tough guy. Like all y'all know tough guy. Like you can't show tough guy anything because he's seen it already. And that's how when I, when I first started working with De Jesus, this is what 
well, this is my first impression of him. There was this class, like, hey, man, this is the uh, Carl Gustav rocket launcher. It can penetrate six inches of armored steel. has an effective range of 800 meters. Are there any questions? And the Jesus is over there like, nah, man, in Puerto Rico, everybody had a rocket launcher. You know, so be glad he was, be glad he was on our side. Um, my middle, so my middle guy was Eric. Eric Saransky, good, solid kid from the Midwest. He was a private first class. He'd been with us about a year. I, I liked having Saransky because he was easy, easy to work with, mentally alert, physically strong, morally straight. He was the kind of guy that you would just like, he's a good team player. And as a team leader, my job was to get these guys up to speed really fast. Because once you get in the regiment, we're deployable within 18 hours anywhere in the world. So we had to get them going and get the concepts into their head space pretty quickly. Saransky, you just showed him one time and he got it. I loved having him. Which brings me to David Floyd. David Floyd was our newest guy. He had been with us maybe eight, nine months. He was a private first class. He was from South Kakalaki, Carolina. I don't know how many of y'all have ever visited the South, but South Kakalaki is somewhere down near Mayberry. And that's what Floyd looked like. He was just a spitting image of an old guy named Barney Fife. He was 135 pounds, about this tall. And he was just goofy, like he didn't look the part. His helmet was always crooked and his body armor just kind of rattled on him. And he, I grew up in the South, so you have to be polite. So the most, the most polite thing I can think to tell you, David was what we would call a bless your heart. So when you see him, <laughs> he was just kind of, hey, Sergeant, how you doing? You know, like, oh, whoa, bless your heart. And you know, I, I thought David just wasn't as fast. He wasn't as quick. He, he wasn't, he, he didn't. He, he was, I don't want to sell him short, because that would be unfair. That would be telling you he wasn't a good soldier. He was a strong soldier. You just had to work with him a bunch. And as a young team leader, I thought that leadership, and this is what they, look, y'all, they told us when you walked into the Ranger Regiment, leadership has never been the rank. It is not the, the pay grade. It's not the stripes on your shoulder or the shiny things on your collar. It is the example we set for the people we serve. And everyone in this room serves somebody. We got people we answer to. We got people that are looking to us to take care. And what I hope that you're going to get from this whole story is what it took me a long time to figure out was that leadership is the example we set and there's people counting on us. I just don't think people tell you all enough. I don't think that they tell you how important you are, and I don't think we tend to believe how important we are, and so we end up selling ourselves short. And we just sort of, you know, we don't step up. We don't know that there's people always counting on us. And if you know that, and you believe that, then you can start to live up to it. But it starts with knowing how important you are. As a young team leader, I, I was misguided. I thought, set the example for others to follow. What I thought it meant was, watch how good I am. That's, I'm performance based. So I'm gonna shoot, move, and communicate. I'm gonna run faster, move hard, smarter, communicate better, shoot better. And if I'm setting the example and I'm better than you, then you must be not be in my, why are you taking so long, Floyd? I've shown you this once before. Come on, we gotta go. And you know what? As, I don't know why we do it, but we've been doing it since we were kids, when we don't think someone's as good as us. And we don't think they're holding themselves to the standards that we're sure that we hold ourselves to. And then they don't stay at, at practice as long as I do. And they don't go to, they don't raise their uh, family the way that I think it ought to be raised. And you know what, I got my own problems. It's tough out here, I ain't got time for that. And you know, we start distancing ourselves from the people who need our help. And I get it, it is tough out here. Y'all do have your own things you gotta worry about. But part of the burden of leadership is coming back and helping people and coaching them and mentoring them, mentoring them, pushing them. Because that's how we all got where we are. None of us got where we are by ourselves. If you ever meet someone that tells you they're a self-made man, you should punch them in the throat because they're lying to you. And so Sergeant Watson was more interested in teaching me to be a better leader than seeing how fast and good of a shot I was. I know a lot of people that can shoot, move, and communicate, you guys. It doesn't make them great leaders. What we call this, and that distance we put between ourselves and the people we need, is called leaving someone behind. So Sergeant Watson was like, you had to go back and help him. You know why? Because David Floyd, whether he knew it or not, and whether I wanted to admit it, was the single most important piece of our puzzle. The most important man in the platoon was Private David Floyd of Third Squad. Why? He had a job to do. And as good as all y'all are in this room, as outstanding as you may be, you cannot do it all yourself. David Floyd was our machine gunner. If he wasn't the best machine gunner, he could be third squad's weak. If third squad is weak, the platoon is crippled. If the platoon is crippled, Sergeant Watson can't send you on the job. So you put everything you got into that kid so that when they say get it on and you look to your right, as goofy as he is, bless his heart, he's still a great machine gunner. All right, so I'm, I beat that up, but I'm setting up the story. So here's how it goes. Uh, 
The mission statement, Sergeant Watson comes walking out of the briefing room and he's got an aerial photograph of a building in downtown Mogadishu. I don't know how many third world countries y'all have flown over in your lifetime. And I guess if I had a PowerPoint slide presentation, this is exactly where I would show it to you. But they, show, they told me that it was classified. So please don't tell anybody that I'm fixing to show you this. If, whether it's Baghdad, Mogadishu, Tikrit, Kabul, Ramadi, Djibouti, I've been over a ton of third world countries. Every building in the third world looks exactly like this. Do we have, can everybody see that? All right. Show the whole class. There we go. All right, and that's what we got. So Aaron Watson throws it on the ground. He says, huddle up. He circles it with red ink. Here's the target building right here. And this is the corner of the building we're roping in on. And he holds it up. He goes, are there any questions? And that was it. That was our plan. Now look, that, that's not minimal planning. That's just the play being called in the huddle. Now, if you've done these three things that we talked about, these principles of mission success in advance, and y'all look, please don't confuse, these are not special operations tactics. These aren't some sort of ideology I'm throwing at you. This is a principle. A principle is a truth. It works across the board. You gotta make a plan. You gotta plan. And, and, and you gotta train. What, what's your plan? What are your contingencies? What are your what ifs? Most of us tend to plan for best case scenarios, don't we? Oh, it'll work out. But if you start knowing that things might go wrong, you got to plan for those conditions. Really what it comes down to, I can teach you the planning process, but you got to know what your mission is. And what I love about FFA is you guys have a very clearly stated mission statement, which everybody knows in this room. That's fantastic. More importantly, when you wake up in the morning and you look yourselves in the mirror, what is your mission, y'all? What are you out to do? It can't just be, oh, I got to get through this next class. I want to graduate. I just, I just want to get out of here. It's, it's got to be something bigger. What is your mission? Once you know that, then you can start implementing that plan. And then once you have the plan, you get better at it. And look, y'all, this is a principle. We call it train as you fight, fight as you train. Because you're only going to be as good as you prepared yourself to be. But coach would have told you the same thing. Practice like you play. We're going to practice hard. You go to church on Sundays, they will tell you, you will reap what you sow. If you sow greatly, you will reap greatly. You go to some kind of counselor, they'll tell you the same thing. Hey, we're going to get out of this. What's put into it? Planning and training will get you ready. So then when they call the mission, this is all you need. You just go make it happen. And then it comes down to the third element, which is leadership, and that's you. Leadership. They don't just say the officers. They don't just say the middle management, the, the, the counselors, the key lead. General Garrison, he has a job to do, yeah. Colonel McKnight has a job. Captain Steele has a job. Sergeant Watson has a job. Oh, Private David Floyd, that kid's not in charge of anybody. Y'all, let's get that out of our headspace that being in charge means you're a leader. But David Floyd is in charge of himself. And if he's setting the example for others to follow, then we know leadership at every level is firing on all cylinders and our chances of mission success are greatly improved over whatever it is we're up against. All right, I beat that up too, but we're setting up the story. All right, so follow me. We're going to head in on the mission. Pretend this is north. If this is north, east, west, south, basically the helicopters come in from the north. They break off into two rows of helicopters. One row goes down this street. One row goes down that street. We're heading into the middle of the city. There's a target building. It's the middle of the day. The middle of the day is no fun for us because they can see you. And they call them bad guys for a reason. They like to shoot at you. So if you know people are going to be shooting, it's preferred they don't see you. So we would usually go in at night, but we couldn't help it. Middle of the day. They were meeting in this building. First bird's in a little bird helicopters. That's the one you saw with the guys sitting on the outside. They're on the bench. Little birds are very maneuverable. They can land on the roof. They can land in the alleyway. And all those Delta guys got to do is step off. And they're, they're inserted. So they're going to hit the building from the top down. Rangers are going to come in on the Blackhawks. Blackhawks are too big to land in the streets. So we're going to have to hover in at corner number one, two, three, and four. My bird's coming in on corner number three. So Super 66 is our call sign. Sergeant Thomas. As the man in the door of the aircraft, you will be facing the building. You'll be facing the target building, and you'll be on the left side of the bird. So your responsibility is twofold. The first responsibility is to identify the target building and concur with the crew chief. And I'm thinking, okay, I, remember now, this is what I'm looking for right here. And I figured I'd know it when I see it, because it will be circled with red ink. And nothing goes according to the plan. And man, when we started coming in and the birds started slowing down and they started getting about 100 feet off the ground, now you can't see anything. Complete brownout. Dirt, dust, swirling everywhere. And I'm like, 
man, I'm looking at the crew chief and he's shaking his head. How do the pilots even know where they're going? And I see Chief Wood talking to Chief Fuller. And I grab the headset because I figure, okay, well, they, got, they know where it is. This is what they're talking about. And this is what I heard Chief Fuller say to Stan Wood. Hey, Stan, can you see anything? Negative, I can't see squat. And I'm like, oh, the pilots don't know. And my buddy's down here going, hey, man, what'd they say? And I'm like, hey, we're good. Don't worry. Don't, don't tell them the pilots can't see. So when the helicopter, I don't know how he did it, but when Stan Wood flared that aircraft, he was right off. I'm like, oh man, there's a target building. I could see Delta guys on the roof. I could see the flashbangs going up. I could hear the gunfire start. And I look across the road. I see bird number one coming to a flare. Bird number two's already got their ropes deployed. Four's behind me. I can't see four. Sergeant Thomas, your third, your second job when you hit that target building is you're going to deploy the rope. I got my squads packed in here. There's another squad packed behind me. The reason I'm in charge of the rope, I have a 90 foot, it's just coiled up. It's a three inch braided rope. We're gonna slide down the rope. The reason I'm in charge of this is because I got to go to this school. It was three days, it was a class, it was a course called Rope Master School. I will never ever get those three days back from my life. So I'm gonna save you guys the time and I'm gonna show you what I learned in Rope Master School. You ready? Go! All right, so that, that it's, it's a simple little thing, but my guys trusted me to make sure, they, they didn't, they, nobody had the time to make sure they looked out and see if there was enough rope to get them to the ground. You know, and if you ever get in yourself in an algebra class, and you start asking your algebra teacher, man, this stuff's stupid. I will never, I will never need this. I, I beg to differ. Because if you kick a 90-foot rope, here's a good algebra question for you. You kick a 90-foot rope out of a helicopter that's still hovering at 120 feet off of the ground, what happens when you get to the end of the rope? That's real-world math right there, and it's bad math. So my guys are wanting me to make sure they're good. So they're going out. Now, I'm the last man out of the bird. As I reach for the rope, the crew chief, his name is Ned Norton. Ned has got one hand on the minigun. Minigun is this crazy awesome gat belt fed Gatling gun that just makes crazy noise and puts a thousand rounds down range. And Ned has got one hand on the gun and his other one is yelling at me. I'm the last man out. As I reach for the rope, Ned starts pointing at his helmet and I, I stop, I go, what? And he's like, he, you know what he's doing? I thought he wants a head count, it, but it doesn't make any sense. I'm the only guy on the bird and he's pointing at his helmet. He's got this sticker he put across the helmet, it's red, white, and blue, and it says, no fear. And that's what Norton's yelling at me. No fear! And the last thing Norton heard me say was, screw you! You know, I disappeared. And I, I caught up with Norton like a week later. We were, we were in the chow hall. And I was like, hey man, what was up with that whole no fear thing? <laughs> he goes, man, I thought that would motivate you guys. I was like, shut up, dude. You flew away. Like, <laughs> don't, don't be that person. So when we hit the corner of the building, we were right where we needed to be. We cleared the building, probably took about 35 minutes. 35 minutes and the mission was done, and we wrapped up the target. About 12 people out of there, put those little plastic zip ties on their hands, trucks that are down the street come driving up, throw the bad guys on the trucks, trucks drive away. That leaves 80 of us on the target building ready to go home, X fills in three minutes, get you guys together. And in that three minutes, everything's done, man. We thought the mission was over. And in that three minutes, just like that, everything changed. And that's when the first helicopter got shot down. That's where the whole Black Hawk Down thing came from because the guys, everybody, everybody's radio was on the same freak. And you hear it just yelling, hey, there's a Black Hawk going down. And it was Chief Walcott's bird. Super 6-1 is heading off to the northeast and he's in a kind of a spiral. And we're all looking at it. And we, I, can, I can equate what we were feeling because you felt the same thing. It's the same, it's a human feeling. I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever been in a car wreck or you've gotten... Your town got hit with a storm or something. I mean, you got that phone call that was just awful news. And we're all saying the same thing. I, man, I can't believe that's happening. And because it's not supposed to happen. That's the 160th, the Special Operations Air Regiment. Like, they're as good as it gets. They're not supposed to get shot down out of the sky. And, y'all, the challenge is this. I don't, I don't believe that people are cowards. I, I think especially in America, I think we're kind of raised to be this heroic lot. People, if they know they can make a difference, if you know you're part of the solution, most of us will step up to do something. But if we don't think we have what it takes and we don't think we're part of the solution, we will generally default to doing nothing. And nothing doesn't look like people running away in fear. I think what it looks like is this. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that's happening. Oh, 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 I hope those people are gonna be okay. And then I still struggle with this one, y'all. I hear myself saying it on a daily basis. 
Well, that's not true. Maybe on a weekly basis. I try, and I, hear, I catch myself saying things like, you know, somebody ought to do something about that. I, yeah, somebody should do something about it. And I'm in total agreement. Who do you think that somebody is? It's you. Thank you. It's you. It's us. Because unfortunately, we don't have to like that burden. But if it's happening to us, it's happening to the people around us, on our left and our right. And in an environment like the Ranger Regiment or even the FFA, where you walk in and they say, hey, congratulations, thank you for being part of this elite, honorable, and noble unit. It's not about you anymore. You are here to take care of the people around you. You are your brother's keeper. Man, and I'm like, Ugh. when that's your mentality, take care of each other. Your only option when something happens is to do something about it. And fortunately, we had a plan in place and we knew exactly what we were supposed to go do. So the guys that had just driven away with the prisoners on the trucks, they're gonna turn around and reroute. They're gonna meet us at the crash site. The 80 of us on the target building are now gonna move towards the target on foot or move towards that crash on foot. So I'm watching all the guys run down the road. It's, it's three blocks to the east and then a left turn north. So we're moving out. Now we're the last squad to go and it, it feels, it's a, it's a foot race because I'm looking in my peripheral, y'all, and I can see bad guys running down the streets and I can see get bad guys on the cross streets down a couple blocks down and everybody's racing for the crash. And so the 80 of us are moving. We're the last squad to roll and I look back at Doug. He's the last man on the corner. I'm like, Doug, I'm moving. And I pick up the go and I look back and he's not coming. And he looks at me and he says, man, I'm hit. And something caught him across the neck, and Doug's bleeding pretty bad. The medic runs over to Doug. Sergeant Watson runs over to Doug. And Sergeant Watson, maybe, maybe he spent 20 seconds over there with Doug. And his first, you know what the first thing he said to me? He comes walking back over to me, and he has the radio from Doug, and he hands it to me. He says, Bourne's been hit. We got to send him out. You're in charge. And I looked at him, and, and I looked at him. I see Doug's kind of, I figure Doug's going to be okay because he's moving down the road, and he's breathing, and he's still alive. And I, I'm like, I'm still holding the radio. I said, Sergeant Watson, how are we going to get him out of here? And Sergeant Watson stopped me. Sergeant Thomas, look at me. And he, he wasn't the calmest of men. He, he said, look at me. Because he'd probably see it in my face. Like, I'm in charge, like right now. And, and he says, you're in charge. And he let go of the radio, and he headed on down the road because he knew what was going to happen. And y'all look. Every now and then I get invited into like, the high schools, and you don't get a whole lot of time in the high schools because they only give you like 23 minutes uh, and then their attention spans are crazy. You guys are doing way better. Good job. Um, but this is the story I tell and I concentrate on. You're in charge, like you're in charge and you don't have to be happy about it. I, I get it, y'all. It's not fair. I believe you. I, I agree with you. And I understand this is not what you asked for. I and I will, I will cry with you later on down the road on your shoulder and I will tell you I know it's not the way it's supposed to be. But by God, you got to own it. Because if you don't own it, who will? Someone else. And the someone else is always the people around us, and we don't do that to each other. So I took a deep breath, like it or not. I had practiced for this. I knew what I was supposed to do. I clipped the radio on my hip. All right, guys, that makes me the team or the squad leader. De Jesus, you're now the team leader. And De Jesus, of course, he's running down the road. In Puerto Rico, everyone was a team leader. You know, follow me. And we're like, all right, go with him. Uh, and I just looked at Saransky, I, Saransky, and he knew what I was going to tell him, which was take care of Floyd. So all of us are moving down the road. When we make the left turn towards the crash, that's when everything got bogged down. And if you can picture the crash sites about two blocks up here on the right, I would say about 100 men are now fighting an entire city. They told us at that point in the battle we were outnumbered 10 to 1. Now, I never saw 10 guys. But I did see twosies and threesies everywhere, running, firing. And the volume of gunfire was just crazy, over the top. I hadn't, I'd never seen anything like that in any firefight we'd ever been in. And that's where, long before they ever made the movie, we call that moment Hollywood. Seriously, there were rounds going across the street. There were tracer rounds. There were helicopters doing gun runs. And Sergeant Watson was up against the wall at one point. And it looked really, it looked just like special effects for a second. He was up against this wall, and the rounds go, kick, 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 And he go, she's like, well, that was close. If I get shot, you're fired. You know, and he runs up there. And, and it still felt like training. I just put my guys in a position where they get an effective field of fire. ID the bad guys. If they got weapons in their hands, take them down. Why is this taking so long? Hey, man, we just got work. Chief Walcott didn't make it. His body's stuck in the wreckage. We got to get him out. It's going to be about 10 more minutes. Hold what you got. It was training up until a point. I felt like it was training up until a point. And the point was when it, it wasn't training anymore. And that's when people start getting hurt. And when guys start going down, y'all, 
And now we know, we know what to do when people get hurt. I can, we can come in here and teach you guys a combat lifesaver course in a half a day. And every one of you will understand blood loss and airways and you will be able to keep someone alive. We have a 99 point something percent survival rate on the battlefield right now. We're very good at it, which is why you will see veterans like the one you saw in the video with so many people coming home with titanium steel body parts because we've been able to keep them alive. And please don't think that they want us to feel sorry for them. They just want another, they want purpose and direction and motivation just like you do. When they come home and they've done the hard work of rehab, put them back to work, y'all. Help them out. Help them out. Be part of the solution. Thank you. All right. Now look, when people start going down, I can teach you what to do. Re you will react. But what I can't teach you how to do is how to emotionally handle that moment because you care. You care deeply for that person. He's your friend. She's your buddy. And if they're not your friend or your buddy and you don't care about that person, you darn well cared that they were the person you counted on because you needed the 203 gunner. You needed the CCT kid. Who's gonna talk to the aircraft? The platoon leader knows the plan. Oh my gosh, man, we gotta pull them aside, help them out. You, get in here, hold the line. You gotta do your job and their job. And it's overwhelming and you wanted the bad guys just keep coming. And you wanna yell, time out, time out. And you can't yell time out. Because it keeps coming, and I know the movies always love showing that guy, right? That guy that freaks out on the battlefield, starts peeing his pants, like, oh God, I can't do that. Like, I, have no, I have no idea who that person is. I have been over there nine times. I've never even heard of it. Not, certainly not in, in the American military. I, maybe the French army or something, but like, I mean, not, not, <laughs> not, none of our people. Why? Be, that's probably not fair, y'all. Are there any French soldiers in here? I apologize, all right, sorry. Uh, you know why our people don't step out of the fight? Because it doesn't matter whether you are a clerk, an aircraft refueler, an operator who kicks in doors for a living. We are taught from day one that you have a job to do and you are being counted on. And we all know that if we pull out of the fight, it leaves somebody hanging. So we don't. We hold the line and we do what we've got to do for each other. Yeah, and this is, there's an important thing you, you got to get right here. This is when we need you. Future, the, the, the future leaders that you guys are, are, are preaching to yourselves that you want to be and the purpose and motivation and direction, the purpose-driven people that you want to be, you know when it's going to be tested, right? It's hard to have a testimony without a test. It's going to be in the hard times. That's when we need you. I got no use for a leader who can stand up when it's sunshiny and happy outside. What I need is someone who can step up when it's tough. And man, General Garrison is not coming to save us at this point. The guys that we have to help each other out are the Saranskis, the DeJesus, and the Floyds. And you better hope that you've put everything you got into them. The first guy I saw get hit was a Delta Force operator. And I want, Earl Fillmore was as good as it gets. That guy was three times the soldier that I was. Three, I looked up to him. And there was this aha moment. And I'm sure we all came to that point. Oh my gosh. If it could happen to Earl, it could happen to me. And if it happened to me, it could happen to my guys. And I can't let that happen. And so all you, this is when I started seeing people do, her, not, not just, we throw the word hero around quite a bit, but I'm talking about acts of valor. Because we all started getting it. And you know what, I've been telling this story for a while, you guys, and it's, it's evolved for me. Where I'm at right now in my life, in my walk, in my faith, I think that moment right there, how big it was, it's a shame. It is such a shame that we had to lose somebody like Earl Fillmore for me to figure out what they've been trying to tell us since we were little kids. You are your brother's keeper. Take care of each other. Look after one another. Hold your sister's hand when you cross the street. We're in this together. Like, it's so simple of a concept that most of us can't, we can't grab it because it's too simple. Because somewhere along the line, the world's lying to us and the world's telling us it's about us. Put up good numbers, man. Do this, do that, about you. Look out there, number one. But, but, but it, it isn't. Because alone we fail. Some of us are better at take, you know, some of us are better at than others. I'm sure y'all, some of you guys out here got some single parents. Single, my mom was a, she was skilled at juggling chainsaws, but she couldn't do it all herself. She needed help. We had to help her out. And, and that's when I got it. I look back, you know what, and I bet, I bet if you went back to, Man, like the Battle of Gettysburg, and you talk to those boys on both sides of the line. 
neither one of them will tell you that it was about slavery or North versus South. They won't tell you in World War II it was about Nazi Germany and Korea. It wasn't about uh, socialism and communism. It wasn't ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Sunni clan fighters. All you are fighting for at that moment is each other. It's that simple. And the first guy I went to was Floyd. Floyd's looking down this way. He should have been pulling security down this alleyway. Saransky's on that corner of the building. De Jesus is over here. And I look back. I looked to Floyd first. I said, hey, man, I need, look at me. And he's sort of cheating, looking over to where Earl's body. He said, hey, hey, take care of these guys. I can't, I can't be here. I got to move. I'm going to go back and look at the crash. I got to check on the crash site. I'll be right back. Take care of each other until I can get back. Do what you know is right. And I let go. Now, that's a tough one for me. Let go. Because I can't be there. I want to be there. It's kind of like your parents, man. They want to be there to stand over your shoulder and tell you when, when you're cleared hot. But I can't. But I got to know up until that point, I've done what I can to make sure that those guys are ready, which is why I put them through tough, realistic, hard time training so that they have the skill set and the ability to make the right decisions when I'm not there. I can't just make it always fun for them. So please, y'all, you got to understand that. It's supposed to get tough because when the tough times hit you, then you'll be ready. They're coming. I can't tell you when they're coming. I can't tell you where, but I, I know by God they're coming. Now, I'm, I'm condensing the story quite a bit, y'all, but this is when it became just us looking after one another, fighting through the night. They told us uh, there were 135 guys on this battle, so by this point we've got 78 men are wounded, 18 are dead. We just didn't have enough people to get... We, we could, even if we could have gotten Chief Walcott's body out of the crash, we couldn't have got all of our wounded guys back. And really, we just held on and, and, and fought for each other through the night, hoping that they would come get to us soon. And our hopes were pinned on the guys who were on the vehicle. Remember I told you the guys that drove away with the prisoners on the vehicles? They never got to us. They just kept getting hammered because, remember this, y'all, the enemy has a plan. The enemy gets a vote. That's what we call it. The enemy gets a vote. Please don't be naive and think that it's the, 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 whatever it is you're up against. Now, for us, it was Sunni clan fighters. I don't know what your enemy is out there, but it's got a plan. And, and they're going to try and alter yours. So be adaptable when it starts changing because they're not just going to stand back and let it happen. They hammered those guys on the vehicles all night long because they didn't want them to come in for us. But finally, those guys pushed through. They went and got help from the 10th Mountain Division. 10th Mountain Division... They weren't door kickers or special operators. Most of those guys were combat engineers, cooks, and mechanics. They didn't have the equipment they needed. They didn't have the proper setup, but they came to help. Because they looked around and they're like, man, there's nobody else. And they came in. When they got to us, it was four in the morning. We got to fight. Daylight's coming, man. At 5 a.m., it's going to get bright. We got to hustle. So we load all the wounded guys on the vehicles, and now we got to make a plan. Because you can't just everybody run for it. That's just crazy. So you still, it's not a deliberate plan. Because this was so far in the wood of contingencies. So we had to make a hasty plan. So all I need really to make a good little hasty plan, remember this is the five W's. Who, what, why, when, where. Who, all right, gather up. We're gonna make, we're gonna make a plan, plan. Who, us, what, Xville, why. Well, people shooting at us. When, right now, where, that way. Here we go. And we all start taking off. And we're running, now it's working for a minute. The vehicles are kind of rolling up ahead of us and they're stopping at the intersections and covering for us. And then the daylight comes and then the morning prayers start. And I don't, I don't know what the morning prayers were saying, but to me, they sounded like they were saying, kill the Americans, kill the Americans. And then the gunfire started, daylight. And then when the first rocket skipped off the hood of that lead Humvee, the driver who had just been, man, that guy had been under gunfire all night. So he just sort of instinctively started doing this, getting a little bit faster every time. <gasps> And, and, then the, and then the rocket hits him, and he goes, <gasps> and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty fast guy, man, and, and I, I'm not that fast. <laughs> and I was, I was like, hey, 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 and I'm just yelling. And I stopped in the street, and I'm screaming at this vehicle. The sergeant major goes running by me, and this is what he says to me. Come on, Ranger, we're running. And I was like, thanks, Captain Obvious. That plan sucks, Sergeant Major. And you, you can't say that, Sergeant Major. They get mad. So we're running, and this is when, y'all, listen to me. Things will begin to fall apart. Even within the elite, even within your school systems, your units, your daily life, your clubs, your, you will see it happen. Things will get stressful and it'll get outside of your comfort zone and your ability to see the bigger picture. The research is very clear on this. 
When we get stressed into a situation and, it's, and, the, and the, the suck meter is tacking into the red, this is what starts happening. We, our ability to see the big picture does this. And we start tunnel visioning. And people stop seeing, and you know what, it's always the little things, right? Devil's in the details. That's what we start skipping. I don't, I don't know if this is a military term, but I call it a case of the screw-its. We just say screw it. I don't need to do the right thing. Even though we know better. Like for example, what is the first thing they taught you to do when you cross the street? That's 10,000 people, we all look both ways. That's awesome, it is a very good technique. And when people are shooting at you, it's a good technique. So we would put a guy on one side of the street, a guy on the other side of the street, we would leapfrog across. And what I saw guys start doing is just skipping it because they were so stressed out. We're running out of the city. There's 25 men running from the city with no weapon, no aerial support, no vehicular support, we're just running. And guys started to screw it, and they started doing this. Bam, 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 come on man, you're clear, let's go. And, 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 and then what do you think the next guy would do? Well, that, that must be clear, I'm just gonna run across. Bam, bam, and, and at some point I stop and I'm like, hey, Rambo, what was that? Like, because who in the world ever taught you to run down the street gunning from the hip? Now, I don't, I don't know if any of y'all go hunting, but if there's any hunters in the room, run down the street, and shoot from the hip and see what you're gonna hit. You, you will hit nothing. Well, I take that, you will hit two things. You'll hit jack and squat, that's what you will hit. And it's not, it's not covering for anybody. And man, things are, I can feel it. I can feel that lump in my stomach. I can feel sort of this collective panic, man. We're all just running. We're not moving fluidly. And all of a sudden, the captain stops. He stops at this big intersection because he can't push across. There's nobody over there. He's on the radio. And, I'm, and then four guys bunch up behind him. And I'm yelling, hey. Sir, do something about that. Move him out. Spread him out. And the captain's giving me the hand because he can't hear what's on the radio. And all of a sudden, somebody did do something about it. And it was David Floyd. Bless his heart. That kid stepped right out in front of me with the machine gun, shoulders. And Sergeant Thomas, look out. And he throws his burst right down the street. And we all turned to see what Floyd was looking at. I, 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 I don't know how we missed it. I don't know how none of us didn't see that. There were two guys... They had run ahead of us. They knew where we were going. They, they ran ahead of us and waited in ambush. And they both had rocket launchers. And they were stepping out of a doorway and they were aiming it right back at us. And Floyd saw him. Now, I don't know if Floyd hit him or not, but he startled the first guy. And the guy kind of misfired and that rocket went just, it missed. It went like this. And I, I watched, and I looked back at Floyd and that kid had just saved, saved our lives. And I wish that I'd had something really cool you know, and leaderish to say. The best I had for him was, good shot, Floyd. And he was like, Roger Sharp, you know, hey. <laughs> now, why him? Why that guy? If you had asked me in the morning, if you, I mean, honestly, if you'd asked me that day, hey, who's your weakest link? I would have been like, well, it's Floyd, probably. Bless his heart. But, but we're working on him. He's going to be a really good machine gunner one day. But you know what, at that point in the battle when it really mattered, I think the weakest link was probably me because I knew better. I knew better and you know what I was doing? I stood back here looking for someone else to do something about it just because that guy had some rank on his collar and I'm yelling at that man was task saturated. I had every ability to go over there and say, hey man, you guys, you guys gotta spread out. And that Sergeant Major, I guarantee you, would have thanked me the next day. Hey man, that was the right thing to do, Sergeant Thomas. But I didn't do it, but Floyd did. So there's two lessons here. What did Floyd do that was so extraordinary in that moment? Amen, he stepped up, thank you. Who said that? What's your name? Lucy, thank you, Lucy. Lucy said see, he stepped up. That's exactly what he did. You know why? Because people who believe they're part of the solution and people who think they're part of something bigger and that they have something to offer will step up. People who don't generally default to nothing. Floyd believed he mattered. He, he, and you know what, it was lost on me. As his team leader, I, I thought Floyd was my burden to carry. I thought I had to take care of that guy. But Floyd did something that you guys do every day. And I, I, I've probably done this thing a hundred times, y'all. I've never not once 
When I, usually what I stand up here and say is, I don't really know what y'all's creed is. This is the first time I've ever gotten to speak to a group that actually has a creed. When you say something every day, you begin to believe it. And when you believe something, you live it. And it's like, look, I believe in leadership from, from ourselves. I mean, that's huge. But, but you got to understand what leadership is, right? Every day, Floyd looked himself in the mirror and he said the Ranger Creed, just like we said it, in formation by himself. And he believed he was a specially selected and well-trained soldier. He believed that his country expected him to move further, faster, fight harder than any other soldier. He made a promise. I will shoulder more than my fair share of the task, whatever it may be, 100% and then some. You can count on me. And when Floyd got to the corner of the building, what did he do? He stepped up and he did exactly what we taught him to do. He didn't do anything exceptional with his skill set. He just did what was right. Y'all, here's the next lesson to that. You can come to your FFA meetings and we can fire you up and your officers can give you all the, the tools and the gifts and the skill sets you need. But leadership is a choice we make on a daily basis and if we don't make the choice, none of the training and none of the planning matters. None of what you're doing. Most of what y'all are doing right now is training. You are getting better. None of it matters if you don't make that choice to step up. Thank you, Lucy. That was a good one. That's exactly where I was going with it. Floyd stepped up. He was an extraordinary young man. And that, my friends, was lost on me. He had gifts. He had talents. He had weapon systems. He had skill sets. And he believed he mattered, so he stepped up and he used them. Getting back to what we talked about on the front end of the story, what I hope that you got from this is how important you really are. I think we, we sell ourselves short, but you got gifts, you got talents, you got skills, you got weapon systems, and they're constantly being developed and you're getting better at it. And you've got what it takes to step up and do the right thing. And, and please stop. I hate those stories. I hate those stories where they say, hey, here's a story about an ordinary guy just like you, who's done the extraordinary deed. Uh, yeah, that may sound high speed, but it's not true. There was nothing ordinary about Floyd because he saw himself as something bigger than just himself. There is nothing ordinary about you. First of all, you wouldn't be sitting in this room. You are a one of a kind creation. There are 7.5 billion people on the planet and there is only one you. Somewhere along the line, God thought there ought to be Lucy. Why? Because Lucy's story matters. That's why. And she's got what it takes to step up and do something with it, but it's a choice that we all make. I don't make this, I don't make this stuff up. I told you, these are principles, these are truths. You can look in the book of Romans. There's this whole list of things that says, hey, all of us got different gifts. If you got a gift to sing, you should sing. You got a gift to teach, you should teach. You got a gift to work the land, by God, work the land. If you got a gift to FFA, I'm sure that was created, you guys have been around for a while, was it back then? I don't know, F, FFA then, all right? But my favorite one in that list in the book of Romans says, if you've been given the responsibility of leadership, take it seriously and lead well. Now, who, who in this room doesn't have the responsibility of leadership? So getting back to the question, how many leaders I got in this room? Remember that. Got it in you. Y'all look, I don't pretend to stand up here and tell you it's supposed to be easy. Like, I know better. It's difficult, it's hard, and like we said, when we need you is when, it, when it's tough. Remember that one, because most people won't. They'll tap out. The very first stanza of the Ranger Creed says, recognizing I volunteered as a Ranger, fully knowing the hazards of my chosen profession. Knowing the hazards. Y'all got it in there, I found it. I started digging into your creed, and it said, I know the joys and the discomforts of agricultural life. Yeah, my buddy Tyler sells seed corn to the Midwest. Man, that, that job of his is up and down, and it's tough. It's not always going to be easy. And I don't, I don't know if you take the FFA creed and, and apply it to your everyday life, but if you need a really good one that's simple and easy, I got one for you. It's on the walls of the Ranger Regiment, Delta Force, the 160th Special Operations Air Regiment, and Campbell, all the CC team, CCT, PJ, Air Force Special Operations guys, and all the, the blue teams on the coastline with the tattoos of small sea mammals on their arms. We, we all have it. It's from the book of Isaiah, the Old, Old, Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And so I answered, here am I, Lord, send me. I'll do it. Put me in, coach. Come on, man, that was easy for a soldier. And the first time I ever saw it, someone had put it up on the airplane hangar. I didn't even know what it meant. I, I was wondering about it. I'm like, here my Lord, send me Isaiah. Man, I bet that dude was a ranger. 
and I move on down the road. Isaiah was not. He was a prophet. But send me came easy. And for all y'all who have friends and family and for the veterans who stepped up, send me came issued. I knew what my purpose was. I knew where my place was. I was here to take care of this and that. Him and her. That's it. I don't get to do that anymore. And for those of us who have to make that transition back in the world, this is why I'm telling you, we need you to help us make that transition because we don't know where we fit in. It took me 10 years. I got out of the Army. I signed a record deal in 05. We went to Nashville, and all I wanted to do was do music. And I thought that this story was a curse. I was, I mean, I was proud of it. Don't get me wrong. But I was whining and complaining to one of my buddies, and he was like, hey, man, how's the music business going? I was like, dude, man, every time we go to the radio stations, all they ever want to talk about is Black Hawk Down. It's like I'm Kenny the singing ranger. And he's, and he's like, man, shut up. I go, I know, right? He's like, no, no, shut up. I go, what? He's like, dude, you don't have to be happy about the soup sandwich that you just inherited, but you got to own it. And Jeff was right, because what he was telling me was, hey, I don't know a single other person and out of the 135 guys in task force range that have a microphone shoved in their face and get to go stand in front of thousands of people on a daily basis. So you better figure out what you're going to say about us and you better figure it out fast. And I'm like, man, Jeff was right. And so I, I, I used what I had. This is a gift. This is my story. And what have I used it for? What, what, what have I really told y'all that, that you don't already know? I, I've told you, make a good plan, right? Make a good plan, you guys. If you don't make a good plan, you can plan on failing. I've told you to practice hard, study hard, train as you fight, fight as you train. But mostly what I've told you is just take care of each other. Look after one another. It really is, it really is that easy. And if you're, if you're stuck, I get it, man. If you're stuck, well, Kenny, you got this story, you can play the guitar, whatever. Like, I don't, if you're stuck on what your gift is, I'm gonna unstick you. I'm gonna unstick you. It starts right here. The biggest gift we got on this side of heaven is who is on our left and who is on our right. Who are we leading? Who are we following? We don't have to have 10,000 Facebook likes to make an impact on the world. We do it with each other. Remember that. Now, I'm gonna pause real quick and I'm gonna play you a song. Um. Oh, shoot, I should have brought the cable with me. And the song I'm going to do for you, uh, we just found out, I, this song, I, what just took me 49 minutes to talk about, I can sum this song up in a three and a half minute story. I, don't know, I really don't know how music does it. It just does. It reaches people differently. It always has. It's about... Thanks, Mike. Three people. They all had to step up, do something. Man, they didn't want to do it. Nobody wants to step up during the hard times. But they got to do it. Because there's people counting on them. And, uh... Now, I don't know if you guys got time. I think they've got me scheduled to do a book signing somewhere, someplace. My favorite part of this job is the people I get to meet. So please, come say hey. If, um, get a book if you want a book. That's great. That'd be awesome. I, I wrote it really, really slowly in case you don't read so fast. All right, sir. Now, we just found out when, um, on Veterans Day, the Grand Old Opry called. They're like, hey, Kenny, will you want to come do some songs? I'm like, absolutely. Uh, what do you want me to do? And they're like, well, just play your hits. And I was like, that, that's plural. What, what do you do if you only have one hit? And they're like, Play that song. And uh, we just found out that this song made it on the, uh, I don't know, it's a big deal for us. But if they have Cracker Barrels out here, they just put this on the Country Faith record and it's right between uh, Brad Paisley and uh, Mo Pitley's song. So we're, we're right on there. volunteers He got picked out by default Was the only daddy there We know what y'all thinking Choose someone else instead But this league was built on coaches Stood right there and said Not me Not me 
No way this job of mine No way I could find the time Not me No, not me But the world becomes a better place When someone stands and leads the way Steps forward when they rather say not me No next of kin Brother and a sister She knew how hard it's gonna be But she softly said I'll raise him While the voice inside is screaming Not me Not me I can't believe what's happening this isn't how it's supposed to be Not me Oh no, not me But the world becomes a better place When someone stands and leads the way Steps forward When they rather say not me Captain at attention Star penned on his chest He recalls the battle While the final roll calls are red Well, the finest soldiers It was my privilege to lead They deserve the medals The men who died Not me not me, not me I just did what I was called to do You'd do the same if it was you Not me, Lord knows not me But the world becomes a better place Someone stands and leads the way Steps forward when they'd rather say not me. Yeah, yeah, steps forward when they'd rather say not me. That was fun for me, thank you. I don't ever get to do a show where you're... We once did a show where the stage rotated, which was weird because there was nobody on that side and you would come around and there was nobody there. Thank you, guys. Um, hey, God bless you, what you do. This matters. This is setting a foundation. I've got friends who... I had three guys on the reconnaissance team. Every one of them were FFA members. I think this sets the, it sets the bar for you. Thank you for what you're doing. Take care of each other out there. Please remember. Please remember. Come here. You stand there. You look good. Um, remember, remember our troops? You guys are doing a fantastic job of that. I've got a buddy. Just because, they, just because it's not in the news, y'all, doesn't mean it's not happening. 15 years. We've never asked this before. 15 Y'all have never known... A, a nation that has not been at war. And it's really easy to forget that our folks are over there. We just lost another Special Forces soldier last week. My buddy Heath is over there. He's been on his 13th deployment. I would love to have them come home. So we've talked about that. Take care of them. And listen, when you guys head out there on your daily lives, turn on the news and watch what they're saying. They're going to tell you that this nation is fiercely divided. And that never before have we been such a divided nation. Please don't believe them. I've been around this country. Left, right, north, south. We are not a nation divided. 
This is not the path we are heading. There are still 50 stars on the flag. And until that changes, I will choose to believe that we are United States. Because if we say it enough, we will believe it. And when we believe it, we live it. God bless the United States. My name is Kenny Thomas. Kenny, on behalf of the over 85,000 members of California FFA, thank you for sharing your message of leadership, teamwork, and the value of stepping up. Thank you for sharing your perspective as well as your musical talent. Thank you.